We look forward to sharing ways our program has enhanced the health of riparian ecosystems in our region through restoration and invasive species management. This webinar is hosted by the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, also known as SLILO PRISM. The PRISM network is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund in coordination between the Department of Environmental Conservation and various host organizations. We'd like to invite you to take our pledge to protect those who sign up become protectors and receive monthly email blogs showcasing simple actions that you can take throughout the year to prevent the spread of invasives or to manage invasives on your own property. You'll get chances to win cool prizes and also have access to themed virtual toolboxes with many resources and a social media toolkit with ready to share graphics and posts. You can scan the QR code or you can visit ipledgetoprotect.org to sign up. We also have volunteer opportunities that you can join. Moving into summer, we'll host removal and restoration efforts, as well as guided hikes and paddles. Those who volunteer with us can also participate in a challenge where you can earn prizes for each level of participation you achieve. You can visit our website or scan the QR code to learn of these opportunities. And we'd like to invite you to join us for a three-part learning series to be held this spring and summer. And this training is perfect for waterfront property owners, lake associations, kayaking groups, or pretty much anyone who wants to learn more about aquatic invasive species. Participants will learn to recognize and report priority species and be invited to adopt a water body to monitor. And continuing educations will be available for these sessions. I'd now like to welcome Slilo Prism's very own Aquatic Restoration and Resiliency Coordinator, Brittany Rogers. Thank you so much, Megan, and welcome everyone. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to talk about some of the work that we're doing and some of the projects that we are working on. So I'm just going to share my screen now and Megan, if you just want to confirm that we're all good with this screen. Um, good to go. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I'm just, uh, I just really want to start by um, saying that I'm amazed at how diverse the audience is that is in the room with us right now. I really appreciated looking through the registration list and looking at everyone's names and realizing how many people that I'm not really familiar with and I haven't met before. Um, and just kind of trying to figure out where everybody was from and seeing the chat this morning too, or this afternoon. Uh, it's just really exciting to see that we have audiences from not only all over New York State, the Northeast, the US, but also the world as well. So I just want to shout out a big welcome and thank you so much for choosing to join us. I'll be presenting for about 45 minutes, probably 50 minutes, and then um, we'll have a couple minutes for some Q&A, but if you find that you have questions that aren't answered in the presentation today, please feel free to reach out to me and email me and we can connect, uh, whether it's through Zoom or um, different webinar resources or Teams or something like that, and we can connect and talk more. So I think what the best thing for me to do is to actually just kind of start off by just taking a moment to really show you all how connected we truly are, even though we're coming from so many different areas across the country. So just to bring everyone into the, the same room and on the same page, I'm just going to introduce a couple of different things first. So the first thing I want to talk about is watersheds and where our work falls in regards to watersheds. So we do work in the Eastern Lake Ontario region, as Megan mentioned, and this falls within the Great Lakes Basin. I know most of you probably know that watersheds are land areas that channel, whether it's rainfall or snowmelt, creeks, streams, and rivers, channel everything in together and eventually lead to outflow points to either reservoirs, bays, lakes, and eventually the ocean as well. On the screen, you're specifically seeing the Great Lakes Basin, and this flows from west to east. So I know there was a few from uh, Michigan mentioned on the line and some other areas as well out in the western Great Lakes region. And so everything flows from Lake Superior through Lake Ontario and then out through the St. Lawrence River. So where we're focusing today is in New York. And so that's where the square is on the screen here right now. So you can see uh, we're going to zoom in a little bit more 
Uh, this is a busy slide, but I just wanted to highlight that we have some major watersheds in New York that actually fall into or drain into the Great Lakes. So this includes the Niagara, the Genesee River, Oswego River and Finger Lakes, the Lake Ontario Minor Tributaries, Black River and the St. Lawrence River in Champlain as well. Now, zooming in even further into our region is this square that's highlighted here. So the primary work that I'm talking about today actually falls into these Lake Ontario and minor tributaries on the eastern Lake Ontario coastline um, and some of the, the tributaries in there. So what you're seeing on the screen here is actually the region that Slilo falls into. Um, so we have those major Great Lakes basin uh, watersheds that I was talking about, but the interesting thing too is I know there was a few from kind of the mid-Atlantic coast on the line as well. Um, so the very southern portion of our region actually is kind of different. So it actually drains into the upper Susquehanna and Chenango watersheds, which lead to the Chesapeake. So some of the work that we're doing in Slilo connects even further down the mid-Atlantic region as well. So I also want to talk about New York a little bit and just kind of briefly mention that New York really is a hub of transportation, importation, exportation, and it's very clearly connected to the rest of the world as well. So we have connectivity not only through planes, trains, and cars, but we also have extensive waterways that connect us to many different areas. Um, so for example, in Slilo Prism region, we have uh, seven of the 13 major ports in New York State. So we have seven major ports in our area, um, which kind of leads us to what we talk about with invasive species and an increased risk of invasive species introductions. And part of that is explained why there are so many um, established invasive species populations in the Great Lakes region. So we are kind of considered some of the gatekeepers to the rest of the Great Lakes. And so a lot of the work that we do is trying to protect not just our area, but beyond that as well. So stepping away from the water a little bit and talking about some other prioritized areas or critical corridors that we work in include the Algonquin to Adirondacks region. And so this is really cool. It's a unique bioregion that connects us between the US and Canada. And if you're not from our area, you probably haven't heard the story of Alice the Moose. Um, so this was a moose that was headed towards high populated cities. And so she was captured and collared and relocated into the central part of the Adirondack Park. And with the radio collar on her, they were actually able to, the researchers were able to track her, take a 355 mile journey across the um, Adirondack region, the Frontenac Arch, and then up in through Canada. So this kind of demonstrated the need for these connected corridors and also really a, a good demonstration of the wildlife that are actually using these corridors and why they're so important. And so some of the work that we're doing is included and also thinking about making sure that we're finding ways to prioritize and protect those corridors. At an even larger scale, so you can kind of see these large North American wildways kind of highlighted on the map on the left here. I'm not going to talk too deeply about those, but if you take your eyes over to the right, you'll see the Blue, Blue Ridge to Boreal region. And so this was something that was identified by the Nature Conservancy Science team as a network of resilient and connected lands. And if they're protected and conserved, will allow for habitats to become more resilient to external stressors. And also the work that's happening there can be more impactful on a, on a grander scale. Um, so we do work in just a smaller piece of this huge area that stretches over 2,000 miles, 14 states, and three Canadian province, provinces. Um, so we're just a small piece of that, but we are really working to prioritize our work to happen and improve these connected lands as well. So I don't want to get too deep into all of that, but I just want to kind of take that step back again and talk about Slilo Prism. So we are the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. We're one of eight prisms in New York State. So the map you can see here is the boundaries of the eight prisms. And we were founded in 2011 and we cover five counties in the Northern area of New York that's highlighted in dark green here. We're hosted by the Nature Conservancy and our mission is to protect native biodiversity and freshwater resources through a collaborative approach to invasive species management. 
Um, so that collaborative approach is something that's really important. And I'll mention a couple of times, uh, I know I've already said it before, but I'll mention it towards the end too, that we're always looking for collaboration and we're looking to work with partners to build on and improve the work that we're doing across our region and how it's connected to others. So our core programming focuses on prevention, early detection, rapid response, management, education, and outreach, um, which aligns with the other prisms in New York State and a lot of other invasive species programs across the, the world as well. The main initiative that I'm actually talking to you about is we have multiple special initiatives that we participate in and we lead, but I'm just going to kind of highlight our restoration initiative and some of the work that we've been doing over the last five years. Our core programming and our special initiatives do align very closely with the invasion curve. Um, if you're not super familiar with invasive species, I'm not gonna talk in depth about the curve, um, but I highly recommend looking into it if you aren't familiar with this. But basically our work kind of has this flow where we start with prevention, which is the most cost-effective uh, method of invasive species management. And then we step into early detection, so catching species early on, and then um, kind of as the populations are growing over time and they're becoming more established, we have more of that containment or um, suppression in areas and long-term management plans. There are a plethora of invasive species out there. And in New York State, we've worked really closely with the Department of Environmental Conservation and the New York Natural Heritage Program, along with many, many, many other organizations to develop this tiered species list. So basically, basically, this is a way for us to better prioritize the invasive species that we're focusing on our, our management on, our prevention efforts on, and so we kind of dropped it into these four main tiers. So you have tier one, which is the species that are not necessarily in the region that you're considering, or for us in our prism. Um, and there are some within a buffer around our boundary. Um, so there's a high risk or high potential of them to be introduced. And then kind of moving from tier two to three to four is increased uh, establishment of those species in the region, and then also increased populations that are making them more difficult to necessarily manage or eradicate. Um, so then you have more suppression or containment and local control levels. So this helps us focus our work a little bit. You don't need to read all the words on the slide. Um, it's just kind of a, a depiction. If you're interested, the link is listed here and we can send those in a follow-up email if you need those separately. But if you're interested in looking and learning more about our tiered species list, you can definitely check that out on our website. But now I'm going to keep going with a little bit more definitions and introductions. So uh, the main thing that brings everyone here today is talking about protecting our riparian areas. So uh, wondering what a riparian area actually is, it's just the most basic definition of it is just that it's areas that are stretches of vegetation bordering creeks, streams, and other water bodies. That's the most basic definition. Um, so then kind of stepping the next level is why are we protecting or why are we working to protect these riparian areas? And as many of you probably know, they play a really vital role in water quality and then also provide many important ecosystem services, some of which you can see listed on the slide here. Um, one of the interesting things is that even though our region is only about 1% riparian area coverage, uh, there's research out there that shows that over 80% of species actually use riparian areas at some point in their lives. So a lot of a lot of species are using this and it's not a lot of space that's made up. Um, you know, some of the things that we, for us, are working to protect is thinking about trees and shrubs, um, how they're keeping water cooler, providing habitat for insects, and then also keeping water coolers, providing better habitat for fish species or other amphibians and reptiles. They, uh, the vegetation on the shorelines are helping to stabilize and prevent or reduce soil erosion, um, as well as filtering chemicals and other pollutants that may be seeping in through the watershed. Um, so one of the big things too in our area is that our riparian areas do act as major migratory pathways and our ideal nesting habitats and nesting sites for a lot of species. So um, and when you have disturbed riparian areas, they're usually or particularly more susceptible to invasive species introductions. And those in introductions can have profound impacts on the riparian areas because they, again, alter those ecosystem services that I just mentioned. They have lesser ability to prevent stream bank erosion. Um, you see 
typically higher loads of nutrient loading, increased stream exposure, so the warm, warmer streams and uh, less ideal habitats for fish species. And that means that you're also seeing a decrease in biodiversity, a lot of invasive species, as you can see pictured here today. Um, on this slide is knotweed and phragmites, so they create monocultures and decrease that biodiversity and decrease ability for species to nest at those sites. I'm not talking too deeply about the invasives and um, more about our restoration work, but I do want to mention the three main invasives that we have been managing and restoring those specific uh, sites include common reed, knotweed, and yellow iris pictured here. If you are interested in learning more about these species, we do have links on our website that can lead you to those profiles so you can learn more about the growth types and typical habitats that they would uh, be growing in. So then the next thing is, you know, a lot of uh, potential opportunities to just conduct management on invasive species. So maybe you're wondering why are we conducting management and doing restoration at these sites? And as I mentioned before, we are really a hub for invasive species as we have a lot of opportunities. So through importation, exportation, um, tourism, we have a lot of opportunity for invasive species to be introduced here. And there are a lot of studies out there that have found that the majority of invasive species management, oh, I'm so sorry, my dog is working, um, that a lot of the projects that have invasive species management and removal, they actually report replacement of other non-native species in those locations. So you were able to manage the invasives, but then you have other ones that are coming in. So we've worked really hard to try to identify sites that may be more susceptible to those um, further invasions and have identified those as in need of restoration. So as we talk a little bit more deeply about restoration, uh, this is from the Society of Ecological Restoration, and this is the restorative continuum. So as I'm talking about this, it's really important to remember that this is just a part of a continuum of restorative activities. So it's one of many strategies that are being utilized at the same time to contribute to this biodiversity conservation or increased carbon sequestration or all these other ecosystem services that we might be focusing on, they're all just small bits and pieces of this overall process. So our projects are not necessarily um, narrowly focused on just the invasive species management, but we have multiple other parts that we're constantly thinking about and trying to think critically about how we might be able to improve those. So from a landscape scale perspective, ecological restoration, when implemented effectively and sustainably, it contributes to multiple elements, kind of listed here, but I'll talk about them a little bit too. Um, so this could be considered a solutions-based collaborative approach that engages communities, scientists, policymakers, land managers, to all work together to repair the ecological damage and rebuild healthier systems by enhancing their natural recovery carried out by native or local uh, plants and animals. So areas like the Eastern Lake Ontario corridor and the riparian corridors that we're working in are really dynamic and the removal and suppression of invasive species or invasive plants in these areas creates a really good opportunity for us to be able to restore these systems to a uh, higher ecological character and function to also then maintain resilience and guard against uh, maintain resilience to climate change and guard against reinfestations. So when combining all of these different elements and these different things to think about, uh, we are able to really find that this restoration approach is the link that we need to be able to move our local or regional or our global environmental conditions from a state of degradation to one of net positive improvement. And so now I'm going to get into uh, the the details, a little bit more intricate details about some of our projects. So in 2019, we began an, an initiative to recreate, initiate, or accelerate the recovery of select riparian ecosystems that have been disturbed. So that's our priority, our main goal that we developed. And today I'm going to talk about a couple of our projects ranging from, if you look towards the bottom of the screen, so ranging from a thousand square feet is our smallest site, I'll talk about a project site that's about three and a half acres and then taking it up one more level to a 30 acre project area. And so I'll talk a little bit more detail about these, but 
uh, an hour, although it's a long time, it's also not a long time. So I'll basically be just staying on the surface of these projects, um, touching base on a little bit of the things that we're doing. But if you have any questions or want more detailed information, we do have reports online as well as um, I'm happy to, to talk and share more about those as well. So for each of our projects that we are working on or each of our sites, we are developing long-term ecological restoration plans for these. So we're conducting an initial baseline assessment, reducing the impacts of invasive species through management, um, initiating remediation and rehabilitation. So trying to um, get these sites to recover from the impacts of those invasives, um, continuing management, because if anyone's worked with invasives, we all know that unfortunately they take more than just a uh, a one attempt at managing and removing them in one year. And then finally, we have long-term monitoring that we've set up and planned for. So this gives us an opportunity to actually see these sites, track the native species at them and track the success or find the lessons learned, right? Because nothing is perfect. So finding uh, where we could have done things better and trying to make those improvements as well. So the first project I'm going to talk about is our priority conservation area work. So we uh, have a very big region that we that we cover. So I was showing you the maps of New York, and it's a five county area. Um, if you go from the southernmost part of the region that we work into the northernmost part, it's about a three and a half hour to four hour drive. Um, that's all highway speed, so that's not with any traffic. Um, so we do cover a pretty big area, and so we. Instead of working everywhere, we've prioritized these areas that are um, either high ecological uh, conditions or um, also areas that are, you know, just really important to protect. So then taking those big PCAs that sometimes are a thousand acres or a couple thousand acres, then we go to these HPAs, which are highly probable areas for invasive species introductions. And so then what we did is we have developed this restoration program at the small scale level. So some of these HPAs are only about a thousand square feet. Some of them are um, ranging between or up to like three or 4,000 square feet. So these projects are uh, small scale, again, I mentioned. So we've had four sites over the last couple of years that we've been primarily working at doing management. And so we we're looking at wildlife management areas, Pacific nature preserves, um, public lands that uh, we are going to and serving for invasive species and have an opportunity to uh, find a site that is in need of management. And then that's also going to further protect other either rare, threatened or endangered species or ecological communities that are of high importance or um, are really locally unique to those regions. So we have prioritized by working with, again, I mentioned before, knotweed, phragmites, yellow iris. You'll see that there are two sites that I mentioned, siltgrass and pale swallowwort. I'm not necessarily talking as much about those sites because those are not as riparian area focused. Um, but so then what we do for the different phases at each of these sites is we're conducting uh, vegetation surveys of the native, non-native and invasive species. Uh, doing quadrat surveys, transect and meander surveys as well, ensuring that we have as many species identified at those sites. And then we are conducting management where those invasives are. So that's either through manual removals or herbicide applications, and then following that with either spreading seed mixes or transplanting different native um, herbs, forbs, and shrubs and trees at these sites as well. And then we're working on monitoring and uh, developing and really kind of flushing out this monitoring work that we're doing. So we've got eight small scale projects that we've been working on. So those are spread out throughout our region. And this year we are planning to add more and continue working um, across the board. So I just want to give an example of one of these sites. So small scale, you can see the picture here, all of that like tan uh, dead standing biomass. So this is Phragmites. Um, so this was a, a smaller area that we had found Phragmites had been introduced and it was kind of creating a monoculture. And so we conducted management for a couple of years and then we went in and um, really just kind of, so this was all dead standing material. So we kind of knocked all of that down, raked it out, spread it out um, to give us opportunity to do some plantings in here since there was not really much uh, new growth with Phragmites in the site anymore. 
Um, and our plantings have been very successful. We're still conducting management in the kind of outer limits of the, the area. So kind of on the boundaries of where we had been working and treating, um, but it was pretty successful, almost hundred percent success with our transplants, which is not very common across the board, um, which is exciting. And a lot of the species not only were successful, but they're also, uh, doing really well, flowering, producing fruit. So, um, that was all really good, and we're very excited for that and looking forward to monitoring uh, this upcoming year. So the next project I'm going to talk about is in the Eastern Lake Ontario dunes. Uh, we're working in a really cool area. So there's a 17-mile stretch of freshwater dunes that we are actually working in. And so we've conducted three phases of this, or completed three phases of this work, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about each of those. So the first phase is doing a uh, invasive species inventory and assessment of the impact of those invasives. And the results of that were actually doing surveys in the field and then producing a uh, really thorough final report where invasive species uh, were located and then also providing recommendations. So finding areas that were in highest need of restoration or management in general. And so the results of this report, which is on our website, so if you want to read it, you're more than welcome to. But the results of that gave us five sites that we found were the highest priority um, that were in need of attention. And we only had funding to actually do work on one of these. And so we had selected this one site on North Sandy Pond. Um, in the background, you can see the map here. It's a, a mix of public and private land. And it's a very thin, narrow stretch of uh, freshwater dunes. And so um, part of the reason why we had selected this site specifically is because of the important ecological character of the site. So freshwater dunes, um, there was also a lot of rare threatened and endangered species that have high potential to be impacted by the Phragmites at this site. And then also um, there were a lot of other investments happening at this location specifically. We had had a uh, high water um, a couple of years ago, and it actually had washed out and blown through one of the dune systems. So there was a lot of work happening to rebuild the dunes, which was fantastic. Um, but unfortunately, there was findings that the invasive Phragmites was also getting brought into those new dunes as well. So this site was prioritized, and we collaborated with the North Pond Resiliency Project to help fund some of the um, planting that occurred, which I'll talk about in a moment. <clears throat> So then we did a further um, inventory of all the species at this small three acre project area. Uh, we were able to identify over 107 species at this site. And then to further evaluate the vegetative community at this site, we conducted a floristic quality assessment. And if you're not familiar with this, it's just a standardized assessment that calculates a quantitative value um, to indicate the quality of that community. So, Basically, the short explanation of this is there is a coefficient of conservative conservatism value that is assigned to each species. So um, your lowest score is on a zero to 10 scale. Your lowest score is uh, we. So, for example, a non-native or an invasive species. And then at the 10, a conservative value or C value of 10 would be a rare species that only can occupy a narrow range of habitat, has very specific growing conditions, is sensitive to disturbance. Um, and so then we use this information to better analyze the site. Um, so, for example, Phragmites, invasive species, that has a C value of zero, but sand dune willow, which is one species that we transplanted here, has a C value of 10. Um, we, I don't want to get too deep into the results of this because I could probably talk for a full hour on that, but um, we do have the results of that in a final report. And if you're interested in learning more about that, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about it. <laughs> Um, so our treatments at this site were kind of a mix. So we were doing cuttings of the Phragmites. So you can see in this upper left picture a little bit, um, some of the lines that you can see going across the sand were actually uh, Phragmites kind of spreading out its solens to kind of spread across the area. And so we were hand cutting all of those and removing them from the site, putting them in black contractor bags to solarize them and um, dry them out and kill them off. And then because we were working in such a sensitive area, we were also doing hand wicking for herbicide applications. So you can see that in the picture here. Basically, 
uh, a certified pesticide applicator wears these specific gloves. They put herbicide on their gloves and then they actually physically handle every single invasive plant to get the herbicide applied to the plant. <clears throat> this allows us to completely reduce as much as possible the impact of that herbicide on other native species as they're really sensitive and really fragile. So we didn't want to have such a big impact on them. And then in this bottom left photo, you can see this is a dense monoculture of Phragmites and we conducted foliar applications. So um, kind of backpack sprayed those sites as well. So after all the management and talking about the, uh, so I, was, I mentioned how the dunes had washed over. So this picture you can see here in the, on the right side of the slide. So this was actually all new sand that was reintroduced to the site after it had been washed out to rebuild these dunes and volunteer planting efforts occurred, um, planting our native beach grass, which uh, is a really, really beautiful beach grass species. Um, and so we were planting that native beach grass at this site and then also uh, transplanting clippings of sand dune willow and pussy willow um, down the lower parts of the dune and the back dunes to help kind of stabilize those dunes even more. So that was some of the planting efforts that occurred before we were really getting into the deeper management of Phragmites. <clears throat> and then we also went through and we selected a suite of 20 native species to plant at this site. And so 1500 plants total were planted in the three acre project site. And basically where the Phragmites had been treated, we were prioritizing around that. And then also in areas where the dune um, was not necessarily stable or didn't have a lot of plants in it. So then we were also trying to help stabilize the dune as well. And this is a list of the species that we had selected. I'm not gonna name them off and talk about them all individually. But basically, these are all species that were identified either within that direct site or within that 17 mile stretch of dunes. Um, just because of the dune washing out, we didn't necessarily have a huge example um, of what species should have been there right at the exact site. So we kind of used the entire community as our as our reference system for that. Um, the map that you can see on the right here with these kind of uh, rectangular shapes, uh, this was just one of the ways that we had used GIS to help us actually map out where species were being transplanted and planted into um, so that when we were doing further monitoring, we would be able to track some of that better. All right, so I know that was a lot of detail so far. And now um, I'm gonna talk about our South Sandy Creek Riparian Corridor project. And this project is a little bit more in depth. Um, this was a, a larger scale project. So uh, I have a lot more information to share about this as well. And so we followed similar phases uh, as the other projects and kind of following along with that continuum, moving like from left to right. So starting with your initial baseline assessment, figuring out what, what the areas in need were, and then kind of moving towards uh, a native or native species recovery or ecosystem restoration at the site. In conjunction with our restoration work, we also had our watercraft inspection steward program where we were able to have these seasonal staff or stewards, we call them, um, stationed at specific launches around our region, and they communicate invasive species information to the public and help people learn how to clean, drain, dry their watercraft equipment to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. One of the really awesome things about the steward program is we, we collect uh, substantial amounts of data. And so they were actually stationed at South Sandy Creek and they were able to collect data on the people who were coming to the site and what kind of boats were coming there, how uh, frequent the site was being used. So in total over uh, three years of the, the project, we had collected 1,500 surveys or did 1,500 surveys and talked to 3,500 visitors. Um, so this is really cool because it gave us an opportunity to see where people were coming from, um, what potential risk for future invasions were occurring. But then also we realized how many people were actually at this site all the time. And that even though this was a site we had selected for restoration, uh, it was a really good public demonstration site. So people would actually be uh, interacting with and seeing the restoration happening as we were working through the project. Another thing that we did as well was using eDNA sampling or environmental DNA sampling. And so this is basically, I'm not, I could give a whole presentation on this, but the, the short story of eDNA sampling is collecting a water sample, concentrating that through a filter, 
um, taking it to a lab, extracting DNA from the filter, and then amplifying it and looking for what species DNA was actually present at those sites. So this is a non-intrusive way for us to be able to look for some of those more cryptic or less common invasive species, um, as well as some of our native species that we were looking at, including some Kriganines and um, uh, sturgeons, American eels, species like that too. So it was really cool for us to be able to kind of add that in as an extra element for our inventory for our species. So back to the deeper part of the restoration side of things. So we conducted that phase one habitat assessment inventory. We were looking at multiple tributaries, the riparian areas and aquatic areas of multiple tributaries to Eastern Lake Ontario. And we conducted a full literature review to see what kind of work has been happening there, uh, what the historical knowledge of the invasive species at these sites were. And then we went out and got on the water and actually conducted assessments of the aquatic and riparian species through visual observations. We did rake tosses, uh, horizontal planks and net toes, as well as setting up aquatic live traps just to get a better understanding of the site in general. And the results of this first phase uh, gave us that the analysis of those sites, but then also restoration recommendations or areas that were in need of attention and extra assistance to help improve those riparian areas as well. Uh, one of the cool things about this is that we were not only looking at the invasive species, but natives as well. And this uh, pictured here is one of the live traps that we were we had set up. And this is a pirate perch, which is a species that we had found at one of those tributaries that hadn't actually been detected for over 50 years. Um, so a lot of people are very interested in the species and they didn't even know that it was still existing in this location. So that was something that, you know, isn't necessarily important to the restoration side of things, but we were able to share that information and further emphasize why we really did need to protect these areas. So the results of that first phase are on our website. So if you want more details about that first phase of our work and what those results were, uh, please check out our website to review that report. So our next phase was then to take that next step and actually get out there on the ground and start suppressing the invasive species that were impacting the riparian areas. So we treated 3.2 acres across a 30 acre project site of Phragmites and knotweed. Um, and then we also did mechanical removals of the dead standing biomass to help us reduce the total amount of herbicide that we would actually um, have to use at the sites. And our methods for treatment included both stem injection and foliar applications. Um, stem injection was primarily only for the knotweed species, and then foliar applications were for both knotweed and Phragmites at this site. Uh, in the areas that you can, you can kind of see some of these polygons and the 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 shapes in these polygons, these like kind of bright green um, outlines or boundaries. So this is where we were conducting treatments, and we developed a short list of species that we are then also going to. Uh, take seed and spread a seed mix at the sites that we were doing the management and so. This was an effort for us to try to reduce further invasions of other invasive species. Um, like we have the uh, goutweed species at the site that unfortunately um, we were finding that if you were doing treatments in a location, that was like the first species getting in. So uh, introducing the seed mix to try to outcompete some of those invasive species and then also get natives growing in those areas as well. Um, so this was our priority list. These are all species that had been confirmed to either be growing within this project site or within the wildlife management area. Um, and then we also selected, we worked with the nursery to select species that were from eco regions just slightly kind of south of us. Um, so we were following the same species. We're not able to actually collect seeds on site or do transplants of some of these. And so we did have to purchase our plants. And so um, just kind of thinking about climate resilience and kind of um, the future of the site. So we were selecting eco regions that were kind of more from Pennsylvania and New Jersey area. Um, so just a couple couple hundred miles south of us. And then again, I talked about the the public facing side of this. So the amount of people that were actually coming out to this site, we had to make sure that they knew what work was happening and also to try to like encourage people to stay on. There's a walking trail. So encourage people to stay on the walking trail and not um, walk off into the woods to see where why other people were out there, which was including a lot of our, our staff and contractors. Um, so we erected an interpretive panel at the site and, and introduced a, 
um, riparian areas, invasive species, talked about, you know, what we were trying to uh, prevent from coming in and also what we were trying to protect. So we highlighted some of the native species at this site as well. Uh, we included a QR code for people to scan and visit our website if they were interested. Uh, the next year, so kind of following, or the next phase following after that, we continued our management of the Phragmites and knotweed um, with herbicide applications and some manual uh, or mechanical removals. And then we did a more thorough species inventory and assessment. So we were doing quadrat, um, transect, and meander surveys. We set up photo monitoring points so that we'd be able to, again, thinking about that long-term monitoring plan for that, we were able to um, actually return to these exact same sites year after year. And then because of how public this site was, we also hosted a site demonstration and public experience event. Um, and so we brought people to this site, we walked them down the trail, we showed them how the treatments were occurring, why they were occurring. We talked about the importance of the riparian species. And then we also, um, so we walked on land on the trail. And then we also did a paddle down the stream as well for people to really get a, a better understanding and of what they were seeing from the, the, the water. And, um, kind of that aesthetic value as well, and just kind of allowing people to really get a better understanding of why we needed to be there. Um, some of the upper pictures here are some of the, the treatment sites that we were working at for the Japanese knotweed, and um, then some of the, the pictures on the bottom are some of the really cool native species that we have at the site here. So there are challenges too, right? Uh, working in riparian areas are not always the easiest sites to work in. Um, so this was a beautiful uh, sunny day last spring or a couple springs ago, um, early on in the week. I took a nice photo of one of our photo monitoring points. And when I returned only a few days later, we had had a lot of rain. Um, and this is just a site about three feet higher water levels at the site. And you can't see that I'm actually also standing in water as well. Um, so there are challenges with working in these areas and the species that we're working with um, and what you're seeing here blanketing the grounds in this picture is uh, a non-native species that is slowly uh, was slowly kind of creeping out and taking over a lot of the areas. So uh, a lot of challenges associated with working in the areas that we were in. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of leads into the next part. So then we had to select species that would be able to withstand these kind of major seasonal floods that occur, and then also be able to um, handle dry periods too. So this is uh, the map, which I'll talk about the segments in a second, but just take your eyes to the right of the screen. Um, those are species that we had selected to plant at this site. So this is our, our final selection um, for transplants, actual plants versus uh, seed mixes. And so we had some, I, these are sorted out by scientific name and then also their wet tolerance. So uh, a little less, less, I put that in quotes, less wet tolerant are the species in the yellow, the kind of medium ground ones in the green, and then the one, the species who really prefer or enjoy a lot of water are in blue at the bottom. Um, and so when I say less tolerant to wetness, um, so those species were planted only a couple hundred feet from uh, like 150 feet away from the creek where they saw less flooding, but they were also species that were present there that we know would thrive in these locations and are tolerant of the, the wet grounds. Okay, so the map in the middle, um, I just want to touch on this a little bit. So basically we had this 30 acre project site and what we did is we sorted it, we separated it by north and south shores and then we sorted them into 10 different segments on each of the shores. The reason why we were doing this is because we were actually preparing to plant 6,270 plants in the ground at this site. Um, so on a 30 acre site, that's a lot of walking and a lot of space. And our primary planting method was uh, we have a very small team in Salilo and um, shout out to my team for uh, coming out and assisting with a lot of this. But we were working with volunteers primarily as well as other programs, partners and seasonal staff. Um, so we needed to find a way to be our best organized to planting of this at a larger scale um, project site. This is not meant to be read, it's blurry on purpose. Um, so basically what we did is we sorted out those, those different segments. So 10 on the north, 10 on the south um, segments. And then we had plots in each that were zero to 50 feet, 50 to 100 um, away from the creek. And so then we assigned the total number of species that were gonna get planted in each of those plots, the distance away from the creek. Uh, also we were looking at the 
acreage of uh, invasives that were planted at those that we would um, have a higher number of species at sites where we had done more management of those invasives. Um, so they're higher disturbance areas. And then we were able to basically kind of on a nice spreadsheet uh, version, figure out where we we're planting everything so that when it came time to working with volunteers, we would be slightly more organized. Uh, so this is just an example. We uh, of these sites kind of zoomed in a little bit so you can see those plots um, that are kind of 50 foot segments along the creek shore. And then what we did at the actual site was we put signs out and left them out for six weeks. Um, just indicating what sections we are working in, and then also just acting, asking members of the public not to go out off the trail um, because we were doing restoration. We didn't want people to be like, "Oh, what are what's happening off in the woods, and why are there so many other people over there?" and um, kind of trample any of the the work that we had been doing. So I talked about working with volunteers. So we actually planted for um, seven days straight. So we recruited volunteers to assist us with this restoration. And the next couple of slides are a little less um, detailed, just a little bit more information uh, about the process and kind of how things went. So our plants arrived via tractor trailer on a Friday. We took everything out and sorted them out all by species. And then um, we then sorted them by uh, wet tolerance. So the ones on the the left in this big picture here, those are the ones that are less tolerant to wet. So we're going to plant that stuff further from the creek. And then on the species on the right, including like sedges and bulrushes, um, those are obviously a little bit more wet tolerant. So we really wanted them as close to the creek as possible. And then came the uh, fun part of the project of transporting plants downstream. Um, we carried a lot and moved them with vehicles, but then also uh, the seasonal staff favorite method was via, uh, we use jet sleds that are used for ice fishing, and we put flats of plants in those, and seasonal staff have to paddle them down the stream. So um, although people were out there for really long days, they were able to enjoy it as well. Um, so we started each day with demonstrations on how to do planting, safety reminders, an overview of where we were going to work, so what sections, plots, species we were going to be planting, and then we would kind of just head out and spread out in the, the different sections and kind of plant as much as we could each day and kind of go through that process. Um, so these are just a couple pictures of some of the volunteers or seasonal staff that were out assisting us. So this is that species list that we had planted again. So this is not including the seed mix. This is just transplants. Um, for this part, this final phase that happened last year, we had 45 people in total come out for 650 staff hour, or 650 hours, 25% uh, of which were volunteers and the rest were partners, seasonal staff, and Slew of Prism staff as well. Um, we were able to successfully get 6,270 plants in the ground over seven days, which was really exciting. Uh, and, you know, we kind of started this project off with our goal being to suppress invasive species at this site, including um, primarily focused on Phragmites and snotweed and yellow iris. And then we did some goutweed management. So that was the other invasive that was present at the site. But then we were able to, for this restoration side of things, we were able to really select species that were going to better support wildlife. So we had selected species like the swamp milkweed to um, act as a food source for the monarch, or we had selected the sedges and burr reeds to provide food for other wildlife. We planted trees um, at the site thinking about carbon sequestration and, you know, what, what we might be able to see long term for some of those at this site and also being able to really kind of stabilize that shoreline a little bit more, especially in the areas where we had dense 100% cover of invasives and then we were removing all of that. Um, so kind of think about that water quality aspect. And then the reason why we got so many volunteers at this site was because of the aesthetic and recreational value that's at this site. Um, so by managing some of these invasive species, we're improving that quality of the recreational use of the site, either on the trail or paddling as well. So um, kind of lots of benefits from doing all of this work together. And I just want to highlight, this is just a list of all the people that assisted us at the site.
And I just wanted to highlight how important our collaboration and our partnership with all of these different organizations and the volunteers really was because it was a, it allowed us to really successfully do this. So I'm just going to kind of wrap up again and summarize uh, a little bit about what I talked about at the beginning and just highlight how connected our work really is beyond just the boundary of Slilo Prism, um, including the unique bioregion that connects the Algonquin Park to the Adirondacks or the Eastern Lake, Ontario, Eastern Lake Ontario tributaries connecting to the whole Great Lakes Basin as a whole. And then even further um, talking about that Blue Ridge to Boreal area as well. And really just talk about how, even though we're focusing on these interconnected networks kind of at the local scale or regional scale, the work that we're doing in these riparian corridors is really allowing us to be able to better protect our lands and waters. And I know a lot of these uh, ecosystem processes operate at a much larger spatial scale. These small scale projects from that 1000 square feet that I talked about to our 30 acre project site um, are having profound impacts on their local and regional communities. And when thinking about the importance of this connectivity, there really is so much happening beyond just our program. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to kind of pull us back together a little bit here at the end and just as we're moving into questions and discussions, um, I hope that I'm engaging you in ways to really think more critically about how maybe we'll be able to collaborate, even if you're from uh, different countries or different areas that you might not see the connection right away. Um, find ways that we might be able to work more collaboratively and uh, help protect these really important riparian corridors. And I just wanted to really just say thank you to all of you on the line because there, I know that we have people from all over the place that are are joining us. And I'm just so excited to, to see this network of riparian work growing and um, connecting with all of you and talking about invasive species and the management to occur. So thank you. And uh, Megan, I, I know you have uh, a little bit more to talk about. So before we take questions, I'm gonna pass the, the baton to you. Yes, thank you so much, Brittany. And we will be moving into the Q&A. Brittany, there's um, a few questions in the, in the Q&A box that you're welcome to start diving into. In the meantime, I'm going to just um, launch a poll. And the poll is only for those who are um, members or able to receive credits for, from the organizations listed here on the screen. So don't participate in the poll if you're not familiar with these programs or you're not a member currently that can receive these credits. Um, but if you are, do participate in the poll so I can submit uh, the credits on your behalf for the SAF and ISA credits, but for the Society of Ecological Restoration and the Master Naturalist credits, I'll just be simply emailing you a confirmation of attendance for you to self-report and providing the link for you to do that. So I'm gonna launch the poll and Brittany, you can um, go ahead and start with your Q&A session. Great, thank you. I'll give everyone a couple of seconds to answer that poll as well so that uh, it's not too distracting. And attendees should be seeing the poll now. Um, as panelist, Brittany, I don't think you and I see it. I do see it, so I know that it yeah. definitely has okay, been perfect. published. <laughs> All right, so if anybody's having issues with the poll, do just throw in the chat that you're having an issue and I'll try to resolve it. Cool. So there are so many great questions um, that are being asked. And so I'm excited to kind of dive into these. And I might not, we might not have time to get to all of them. So I apologize. I'll try to be short winded with some of them. Um, so the, I'm just going to pop to the next slide too, so that if anyone, if I don't get to your questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, and, you know, maybe we can connect offline as well. Uh, so the first question that I am seeing is, um, so talking about our herbicide applications. So we 
the reason that we had basically, we were working with a, a licensed herbicide applicator. So the question was, you know, talking about the, the hand wicking um, rather than using sponges, paintbrush rollers or other methods um, for this. So the reason that we had selected this was we were working with a licensed herbicide applicator and um, they just found that this would be the most successful method to be able to actually um, conduct the treatments um, and the Phragmites without getting any of the other species. And so they were using these um, elbow length. So they wore full full suits and then elbow length gloves. And then they had uh, fabric on, an additional fabric glove on. So they were definitely very protected. Um, so I guess, yeah, the question, the, the answer for that is just really, they were, that was the method that our herbicide applicator had, had selected as gonna be the uh, most successful. Uh, the next question from Nancy is talking about the signs discouraging access to the dune sites. Um, and asking about public access within and around our restoration areas. So yeah, the dunes are really sensitive to people walking um, up on them or among them. There are dedicated pathways that people are able to actually access many of the sites. Um, and we just discourage people from actually like walking in through the dunes. There are um, specific designated walkovers and pathways. Um, so we don't really want other people kind of walking into those areas 